Well, dear students, it is time to discuss the different types of stocks. Realizing that these are just broad categories, some stocks fit in more than one category and some stocks don't fit in any category. But it's important to be able to differentiate companies because no companies are the same. We tend to lump them all in together when we say the stock market, but we quickly realize that companies are very different and we need to be aware of that when we do our research. So let's get started on slide 75 with the types of common stocks. Some of you have already heard this term often and in fact during one of the presentations we discussed um, um, types of mutual funds. There was one mutual fund called the Blue Chip Growth Fund and one of the students wrote in the um, chat, what's a blue chip? And I, I didn't catch it, my apologies. Well, we're going to learn what a blue chip is now. <laughs> blue chip stocks, blue chip companies are financially strong, high quality stocks with long and stable records of earnings and dividends. They are often referred to as value stocks, but be careful, we'll discuss uh, growth versus value in a bit. They tend to attract conservative investors. Now, that's nothing to do with politics, folks. It means investors who want to invest in stocks but are worried about the volatility. So they want big companies with their roots deep in the economy uh, that will weather the storm of any uh, economic downturn. So examples of this ExxonMobil, Johnson & Johnson, you know, companies have been around for over 100 years. And where does the term blue chip come from? Well, it comes from a time when only gentlemen owned stock. And gentlemen also gambled. It's what a gentleman did. And at the gambling tables, the blue chips were the most expensive stocks. Oh, well, that's where it comes from. <laughs> Income stocks are stocks with long and sustained records of paying higher than average dividends. Again, they're also often referred to as value stocks. They are normally slow growth companies in mature industries, but not always. Two wonderful examples of this are utility stocks and banks. Are utilities going anywhere? No. Are they growing at a large rate? No, of course not, unless they're in an area where the city alone or the, the area alone is growing very quickly. But people tend not to want to take cold showers in the dark and eat their food raw. So utilities are a reliable source of income. Banks. Uh, there was a day when banks were boring. Thankfully, banks are more boring than they used to be. But when banks got exciting in the late 90s and then the 2000s, that's when we created the global financial crisis. So we can be very happy to hear that banks are becoming boring again. And boring companies pay healthy dividends because they're not uh, using the money to do stupid things. <laughs> and bring down the financial system. Ye hooray for boring banks. The next category are the stars, growth stocks. Stocks that experience high rates of growth in operations and earnings. The growth rates 15 to 20 percent are higher, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if you were growing at 20 percent in three years, you'd be twice as tall as you are now. They are often associated with high price-to-earnings ratios. Usually, they don't pay any dividends or maybe a small token amount. Most of the profits, the, re, the, uh, the, profits, the earnings, are being reinvested into the company. That's why they're sometimes called retained earnings, right? Well, that's what they're called. That's what the accountants call them. Earnings that are not distributed in the form of dividends are retained earnings. The stock price should go up if the company is growing, but we can expect it to be very volatile. What are examples of this? Intel, Microsoft, H. Wait a minute. Are Intel, Microsoft, and HP still growth stocks? Well, they were in the 1980s and 90s when everyone was buying, going running out and buying a PC, but PC sales have slowed. 
Hmm. Some companies, uh, well, all companies, go through a, a life cycle. They start out uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain industry. Maybe that industry is, is just starting, and then they have tremendous growth, and then the growth starts to slow, and now they have to decide what are they going to do. They're gonna, how are they going to reinvent themselves? And some companies aren't, aren't able to do that. Who are the growth stocks now? Right, the the ones you hear about on the on the talking heads by the, from the talking heads on the telly or the internet, Tesla and, and Shopify and and the like. Uh, so we can expect to hear quite a bit about them because they're always in the news and. And we can also expect that there's going to be times when they fall precipitously. So be prepared for volatility with growth stocks. Now, on slide 77, we tackle a little wrinkle in the industry that hopefully you will become aware of. Uh, because it, it's something that, that you're going to come across. The investment world loves to throw around the terms growth and value. But the meanings of the terms are not exact depending on who you're talking with. Typically, investors, pundits on the, on the, in the financial media, will use growth to designate a high P.E. stock, while they will use value to designate or denote a low P.E. stock. But a high P.E. stock might be a great value, while a low P.E. stock might not be such a good value. And a tremendous example of this was you know, several years ago, in January of 2005, Google had become public in August 2004, and the stock price went from about 85 to 200 in January 2005. The P.E. was 70 years. It was very high. The old GM was selling for $34 with a very low P.E. and a huge dividend. The P.E. was 5 or 6, and the dividend was very generous. Today, Google sells for over $4,000 split-adjusted with a much lower P.E., and the old GM stock, which was renamed Motors Liquidation, last sold for $0.04 cents in March of 2011, and is now worthless. So which one was the better value? Hmm? Yeah, right. You see, growth and value are used by the industry in ways that don't always denote whether or not the company is a good value or not. Sometimes a stock that has a high P.E. is a good value. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes a company that has a low P.E. is a good value. Sometimes it's not. To me, value means there's something that is attractive to me as an investor. So be careful, as I said. Just remember that they will use the term value to mean something that has a high P.E. I mean, something that has a low P.E. and growth is something that's a high growth that some company has a high P.E. And it ain't necessarily so that it's a good value or a bad value. Okay, let's continue on slide 78 with speculative stocks. These are often associated with growth stocks, but I like to add the term speculative because these are companies with a very high degree of risk. They're usually losing money, have very low earnings, or they're or you know, or have or are losing money relative to their valuation, they have a very low earnings. There's often they often offer the possibility of substantial capital gains, but they also offer the possibility of substantial capital losses. Biotech, internet, alternative fuels. You know one or two of these companies are going to explode while more than a fair share are going to fail. So when you go in, when you decide to invest in these, it is important for you to have that knowledge because, again, emotions are your enemy <laughs> and they're going to take a toll. 
because these things are incredibly vol volatile. Right? You know, I'm a big fan of Tesla, folks. I really want them to succeed. But the stock is just, it's just insanely valued. So before you go out and buy Tesla, go take a look at GoBroke. I'm sorry, GoPro. <laughs> now, they're two entirely different companies, entirely different business models. My apologies for saying that Tesla is going to go the way of GoBroke but it could lose half its value and still be overpriced, in my humble opinion. I have a little story about Tesla. When they were going through their Model 3 uh, ramp-up, the uh, production hell, as, as Mr. Elon Musk called it, I wanted to buy a couple of shares, just as an affirmation that they'll succeed, because I was sure they were going to go bankrupt. I was absolutely sure. And and I didn't do it. And I wish I never, of course, wish. <laughs> but we learned later on, they didn't tell us this at the time, of course, but they were about three weeks from bankruptcy. They were so close to bankruptcy. And now, dear Lord, thank you very much for letting them survive because they're changing the world. You're hearing company after company saying, by 2030, by 2035, we will only have electric vehicles. And Mr. Musk, many years ago, when he was uh, getting the Tesla off the ground, said, you know, I don't care if Tesla fails. My goal is to change the uh, car industry from internal combustion engine to electric and to electric motors. And in that, he was successful. And also, the gravy is Tesla has been successful. <clears throat> so be careful of speculative stocks. It doesn't mean you shouldn't choose them. But hey, here's the deal. For every one speculative stock you buy, how about buying three blue chips, two or three blue chips, maybe a, an income-oriented stock? Eh? Okay, okay, that's a deal. You decide. Now, <clears throat> a couple other uh, types of stocks that you be, should become familiar with that sound a little silly, cyclical and defensive stocks. Cyclical stocks are round companies. No, no, not that kind of cycle. Uh, cyclical stocks are companies whose earnings and overall market performance are closely linked to the general state of the economy. They will follow the business cycle of advances and declines. The poster child for this kind of company is uh, an automobile company. But anything that makes stuff, uh, timber, basic materials, chemicals, steel, why? Because when the economy is doing well, people are, are, people are getting jobs, their earnings, their, their wages are rising. What do they do? They go out and buy a new car. What's wrong with your own? I don't know. I like that new car smell. It's, breathe that in. It's good for your liver. Uh, no. <laughs> and then when the economy hits the skids, do people go out and buy cars? No. Old Bessie's doing just fine. Thank you very much. So we follow automobile companies and it's it's just they follow the cycle of the just you follow this the um the ups and downs of the automobile company and you see that they follow the cycle of them of the economy they do poorly when there's a recession they do really well when the economy is doing well and that's true of most all companies that make stuff they're called cyclical companies now, defensive companies have nothing to do with you know, the Department of Defense and bank uh, tanks and all that kind of stuff. Defensive companies are the other side of the coin from cyclicals. These are stocks, companies that tend to hold their own and even actually do well when the economy starts to falter. Huh? Well, these are <clears throat> companies like Kellogg's that makes food, food companies, and uh, Procter & Gamble that make uh, uh, soap and, uh, and uh, toilet paper. Yes, do you eat more Cheerios because the economy is doing well? Do you eat fewer Cheerios? No, you still got to eat. Uh, you still have to clean and, and, uh, and brush your teeth. And, and so these are called defensive stocks. And why would they do well when the economy starts to falter? Well, because more aggressive investors will pull out of the cyclicals, pull out of the growth companies, and put their money in the defensive companies. So they are defensive. 
when the economy's doing really, really well, they're sort of sitting in the corner eating their oatmeal. But then when the economy, um, we have a recession, the economy falters, they shine. Slide 80. Now, a couple others that are not talked about that often, and those are the turnaround stocks, the asset plays, and the penny stocks. Turnaround stocks, I usually call them goners because they don't always <laughs> rebound. But these are companies that have fallen on hard times. And what you have to ask yourself as a potential turnaround stock investor is, is there a potential for a rebound? And in the early 1980s, many of you weren't alive then, but Chrysler almost disappeared. They almost went out of business. A gentleman by the name of Lee Iacocca, who, by the way, was the guy who was responsible for putting for creating the Ford Mustang, took the job of CEO for Chrysler and was instrumental in turning them around. And that's the reason Chrysler still exists today. Today, we have GE and Ford and Chrysler as turnarounds. And so far, it looks like they have survived that near-death experience of the 2008 and 2009 global financial crisis because car sales simply plummeted just off, like off, a, off, a, off a cliff. And um, yeah, I was, a, I was in 2006 and seven was not too happy with GM. And I kept saying, you know, if they don't change their ways, they're going to go bankrupt in the next recession. And I thought, well, I don't know. I was going to short them. I've never shorted a stock. I don't think I ever will. But because when you do that, you're hoping the stock goes down. And that means you hope the company does poorly. And I want all companies to do well, realizing that all companies can't do well. There's always going to be failures. And I remember the CEO of GM at the time. I'm sorry, um, GM. Yeah, not GE. GE's on the on the. Uh, slide, my apologies, but GM uh, saying, what's all this talk about bankruptcy? I don't want to hear all this talk about bankruptcy. Uh, yeah, they went through bankruptcy. <laughs> the GM of today is not the same GM of 15 years ago. Oh, and by the way, GE is now a turnaround stock. The storied company, the one company that was in the Dow from 1896 and just until recently, and they are going through some hard times now. But there'll, there'll be parts of GE that survive, no doubt. There are parts of GE that will survive. But whether or not GE will survive as it's been in the past is, is a, up, for, up for debate. Now, the next category is a category that takes some, um, some scratching the surface to find. And these are asset plays. These are companies that are sitting on assets that could be sold or spun off. For example, JCPenney's. They are always thought of as a retail business, and it's been really tough for them and Macy's and, and, and all the other department stores. Many of the department stores from over 100 years ago are gone. But they have an insurance division that is very profitable. They sell people insurance they don't need. And that could be sold to raise cash if need be to keep the company afloat. And who knows? I'm, that, that may have been sold. It may be in the process of being sold because JCPenney's is doing some kind right now. I haven't been following it, but they're doing some kind of thing where they're selling themselves to the mall operators because the mall operators don't want JCPenney's to go bankrupt. They don't want Macy's to disappear. Um, and who, who knows? They might have already sold off that, that insurance business. But when we look at a company, we have to scratch the surface and, and determine whether or not there are any assets on the books. One of, one of the biggest examples is PepsiCo. You think of Pepsi as a soda company, and it is, of course. But what's their biggest? <laughs> they own Frito-Lay, right? They own the company that sells people a five-cent potato for $6. Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, then there's penny stocks. Oh, dear students, stay away from penny stocks. In the face-to-face -face class, we would take a look at some examples. They're there on the website. So do look at them. They're not real companies. There's somebody's garage somewhere in Idaho or Iowa or, or one of those places that starts with the letter I. And they're, they're just scams. If you saw the Wolf of Wall Street, that was the his start in, at the uh, when he got involved in, uh, in the scams. 
he was selling these companies that were just really not real companies. And, um, and he finally got in trouble for doing it. And this is where the pump and dump scams happen. Yeah, just stay away from penny stocks. Now, every once in a while, there's a company that is hit on hard times and is categorized as a penny stock. And who knows, they might be able to turn themselves around. Don't bet on it. Penny stocks should not be discussed in polite company. Now, can we invest in foreign stocks, international stocks, overseas stocks? Well, yes, more and more. Traditionally, it was difficult or impossible to transact. So what the brokerage firms and the banks and the trust companies would do is they would create what are called American depository receipts. Sometimes you'll see DR for depository receipt. Sometimes you'll see GDR for global depository receipt. But usually you'll see ADR, American Depository Receipts. Well, what happened? What did they do? Well, they, they, they went over to uh, Japan, bought a ton of stock in Toyota, a ton of stock in, in, a, in a, a, you know, a Honda or Sony, and then they brought them back to the United States and then reissued them dollar denominated so that it's now very easy for you to, to invest in Toyota. But what has happened is more and more brokerage firms now have international accounts where you can buy and sell the shares on the exchange in Japan or in Korea or in London or in Frankfurt. You see? So what's the key here is that you have to turn your dollars into yen or into euros. And so it can be tricky because you have to take in, into account the currency issues. And it's a little counterintuitive. If you buy a stock or any asset outside, any investment, real estate or whatever, outside the United States in a, in a different currency, a stronger dollar, all other things being equal, and they never are, a stronger dollar has a negative impact on your investment. Whereas a weaker dollar has a positive impact. Hmm? Well, if you have f family and friends down in Mexico, you know this experience because you've, you've experienced it. You know this. You bring your dollars down there. Now the dollar relative to the peso is very strong. So you could go down there and buy a house for a whole lot less than you'd buy it here. But what happens if the dollar gets stronger now that house that you've had to change into pesos, if you wanted to change, you know, sell it and change those pesos back into dollars, you're going to get fewer dollars. Likewise, if you went down there and bought a house and now the dollar was weaker, when you sold that house in pesos, you, your pesos would buy more shares. So it's a seesaw effect. Most all of us retail investors are going to buy our foreign stocks, our, inter inter our international stocks, through global and international mutual funds. It's just they have more resources. They have, you know, they have the expertise. They can keep currencies, inventories of currencies, and issue um, and, and take in, take advantage of some some uh, transactions that will help them uh, suff weather any currency storms and the like. So it's just more. It's more, it's more common for us. Certainly, I do that. Even though the company I work for is is uh, that's one of their uh, their perks, one of their uh, their their um, things that make them shine is when they designed it, they designed the company for international brokerage accounts, and um, but I don't I don't get involved with that. So remember remember the difference between global and international, right? Global means everyone, including the United States. International means everybody except for the United States. Cool. So now, I'm um, sorry. Um, now is a good time to go take a look at us, um, number two, worksheet number two, and uh, decide what companies, what types of companies certain what types of stocks certain companies are. And of course, in the face-to-face -face class, we would 
we would run over there and right now and do it. But you can do it on your own. There's a commentary and an answer key. So have fun with that. Now, let's take a look at capitalization. This is another one of our uh, numbers, our measures of valuation that we learn in Chapter 5. And it's actually very simple. It's what the company is worth. Everybody will, will key on the, the, the price. But the price is meaningless unless you know how many shares are outstanding. Because that tells you how much the company is worth. And there are three basic categories. The papa bears, the mama bears, and the baby bears. Okay. <laughs> and if that helps you, great. And if it doesn't help you, don't worry about it. But we've already used these phrases when we're discussing mutual funds, right? It's one of the problems of doing mutual funds before we do stocks. Large cap stocks are the big companies. And it's changing now. You're hearing people say, oh, it has to be at least $15 billion for it to be a large cap stock. But we'll use the, the numbers that have been around for, you know, about 10 or 15 years or so, 20 years. And that's anything greater than $10 billion, large cap stocks. There's a subcategory of this, which we call mega cap. And if you remember that, that's great. And if you don't, uh, I hope you do, but you might not. Just as long as you remember large cap, because mega cap stocks are large caps. They're just really large. And these are companies that are worth over $100 billion, the very largest of the large companies. And then the mid cap category, you're hearing people say, well, you know, it's really five or six up to 15 We'll stick with two billion to ten billion, but you can change. You, if you want to go with the new numbers, I really probably should change this. My apologies, but I'm still kind of old in that respect. So anything between two or ten billion in our class will be a mid cap. If you want to go five to fifteen billion, go right ahead. I I won't mark it wrong, of course. It's just a different way of looking at stocks. And then small cap stocks recently, up until recently, were anything up to about two billion or so. But now you're hear, hearing people say, no, five, six billion, that's a small cap stock. Okay, well, it's, 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 as the economists like to say, fungible, which is a fancy word of saying fuzzy. Now, anything below about 100 million, you're getting into a subcategory of small cap called micro cap. And uh, again, if you remember micro cap under 100 billion, that's great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Make sure you remember large cap, mid cap, small cap, and then <coughs> penny stocks. <coughs> These are microscopic cap, most of them. And again, should not be discussed in polite company. Oh, and by the way, uh, there's a there's an old... Uh, categorization of penny cap penny penny stops penny cap penny stock penny stocks as anything less than five dollars per share well again technology has made that kind of obsolete uh, but once a stock gets below a dollar a share then the major uh, uh, exchanges New York Stock Exchange the Amex the Nasdaq they don't want them anymore they don't they don't want to have stocks that are worth less than a dollar and so what, remember we talked about the stock splits, the company, if it, if it's a bona fide company and they're really trying to make it, even though they're hitting, they've hit on very hard times, they will do a reverse split. They will take 10 of your shares and give you one share and raise the price tenfold so that it's no longer less than a buck. Otherwise they'll get kicked off the exchange. Yeah. It's not a good sign folks. It's definitely a turnaround, probably a goner. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the formula. If a stock were selling for $20 and it had a number of shares of 5 million shares, then the market capitalization would be $100 million. It's that simple, uh, but we don't even do the calculation. We just look it up. The stock price for the most part is irrelevant until you get below a dollar or so. You must look at the market capitalization to see what the value of the company is. Remember Warren Buff Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway? Right. <laughs> Stock price wasn't important. It was the market capitalization. So this company is a small cap stock. 
and we have a worksheet where we do a few of these, and I'll ask you to do one, but it don't you know, it's very simple to do. Um, you don't even have to use all the zeros. You could just do twenty dollars times five, and then write the word million, and then twenty times five is a hundred, and write the word a million, so you have a hundred million, and you'll see that in the worksheet. So here are a couple of examples, a couple of mom and pop stores you might have heard of. Walmart and Target. <coughs> As of February 17th, 2021. And you look at the price and you say, wait a minute, is Target more, is, is it worth more than, than Walmart? Well, intuitively, you know that, that, that Target's much more than Walmart. And indeed it is because of the number of shares outstanding. There are almost 3 billion shares of Walmart, where there's only about 500 million shares of Target. And so it turns out that Walmart's worth over $400 billion, a mega cap stock, whereas Target's no chump change. It's worth almost $100 billion, $97 billion, a large cap stock verging on mega cap. But still, it's one quarter the size of Walmart with regard to market capitalization. Now, which one's a better value? Well, we're going to learn about that in more detail. Um, we've already discussed earnings per share and price to earnings ratio. And we're going to learn more about valuations in our next chapter. Slide number 85. Here are a couple of... Uh, telecommunications companies that you may have heard of, AT&T and Verizon. Yes, the duopoly with um, T-Mobile trying its best to nudge itself in. But no, these are the two, two, the two 800-pound gorillas. And you look at the price of AT&T and Verizon and you say, well, wait a minute, Verizon must be worth a whole lot more than AT&T. No, again, we must look at the number of shares. And indeed, there are over 7 billion shares of AT&T and a little over 4 billion shares of Verizon. So it turns out the market caps are very similar. AT&T is worth about $210 billion as of the 17th of February. And Verizon was worth $236 billion or so. So they're both mega cap, large cap stocks. And um, and if you just were to look at the price, you'd think, oh, $29 versus $57. No, you have to look at the market capitalization. So if you wanted to own AT&T, if you wanted it to be your personal company, you'd have to walk on down to the New York Stock Exchange where AT&T is traded with $210 billion in your pocket. Well, actually, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because as soon as you started to buy every shares that were all the shares that were offered, what would happen to the price? Right. The price would start you know, going up, going up, going up. And then people were looking around. What's going on here? Who's buying up all the shares? That is why when one company takes over another company or people get together, a group get together to, to uh, take a, a public company private, buy the share, buy all the, the company and take it private, there is a set methodology. They, they go to the exchange where the company is, is based and they say, look, we want to, now no one's going to buy AT&T, folks, <laughs> but, but they, a smaller company. We want to buy this company right here and it's, you know, it's selling for 50 bucks and the market capitalization is $30 billion. We'll offer $55 or $60 for that share. They have to offer a premium. It's called a tender offer. And there's a set methodology for when these uh, tender offers are announced. When, when it happens, if the investment community believes that it's a real offer, a bona fide offer, then the price, boom, right away will skyrocket to that, to that price, to that, to that uh, tender offer price. So in the case of the AT&T, if we wanted to buy it, it's $29.57. We'd probably have to order for $33, $34. And as soon as that information becomes public, the price would, if people believed that it was a real offer. If they didn't think it was a real offer, the price probably wouldn't budge that much. People are just blowing smoke. 
if they believed that another company were going to bid higher, the price might even go higher than that tender offer. So you, can you see the potential for hanky-panky <laughs> in this kind of situation? You, if you had that material non-public information, which we call insider information, yes. And so that's why this, they're highly regulated. And Mr. Elon Musk actually got in big trouble when he did this as a joke. He company it was selling for around 360 or so, 350. This was a few years ago. And his girlfriend and he decided to have a big joke. And they said, Yeah, yeah, we want to take the public private at 420. $420. 420 is the, the number for marijuana. And of course, people believed him, even though he didn't have the cash, he didn't have the money. Um, the stock price, you know. Zoomed up, and then when, once they realized that he was just making a joke, the, he did it via Twitter, by the way. The stock price fell back, and they got hit with all kinds of lawsuits, and the Security Exchange Commission also, also fined, fined uh, Tesla $20, $20 million, and fined Elon Musk $20 million, and he, had, he wound up paying the whole $40 million out of his own pocket. Uh, okay. So, wow, dear students, we're so proud of you. We're almost at the end of our introduction to in, in stocks uh, 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 chapter. Our next and final presentation will discuss different stock strategies for investors. Okay, so thank you so much for sticking with us this far. We're so proud of you, and we'll see you in our final presentation for introduction to stocks.